Hi, all. It is the top of the hour, which means we are starting our second SLU star party. Hi, SLUers around the world. We are going to be watching uh, a magnificent asteroid tonight, but uh, I can see you all in chat at the moment. Uh, a few ground rules because we're trying to uh, kind of find our way into these uh, new SLU a star party. So if you can keep your microphones muted, uh, you can unmute uh, if, if we call your question. If you have got any questions, then kind of flag them up uh, in the group chat uh, and we'll try and spot those. Uh, but uh, everybody is actually already answering the question that I was going to ask, and that is where is everybody watching from? We always say, don't we, SLU is a global community. And uh, I think you're showing it quite loud and clear here. We've got Milton from uh, NC USA. Uh, we've got, uh, oh, hi, uh, Debas. I'm sorry, I keep saying your name wrong. Debasish. Uh, you joined us for our uh, first star party yesterday when we saw uh, that amazing. Uh, very quick flash of the International Space Station whizzing across the sun. We've got Milton back to us. Uh, Daniel's here uh, from Canada, uh, UK. Actually, we ought to have a competition, really, shouldn't we? Like, and, and, and I'm sorry, folks in the USA, but you're probably out of this competition. But the competition should be who is either staying up the latest to watch this lovely near-Earth asteroid whiz by earth or who has got up earlier so it's not going to be anybody in the united states i'm over here in the uk it is midnight here local time um we've got the crew uh, the slew crew over on the uh, east coast of the usa and we've got loads of people coming in from the USA because this is pretty good timing for you, isn't it? Uh, we've got Carol Botha uh, from South Africa. Hey, Carol. Carol uh, is our first member to reach Hubble level. How cool is that? She's earned enough gravity points because of all of um, everything that she's done in the community and to spread the word about SLU. Uh, yeah, that's an amazing achievement. So uh, Summer Eastern, howdy from Austin, Texas, Milwaukee. I have really, for these star parties, I have got to get myself a USA map, haven't I? Yes. Uh, oh, uh, Todd from Bethlehem. I, I recognise actually Bethlehem, Connecticut. Todd actually works uh, in the SLU engineering. Uh, it's very close to our headquarters. Uh, Tarnley Grades here. And uh, hey again, we met yesterday. Uh, Chicago, California, Uruguay, you! That's, that's, that's cool. That has to be the most exotic so far. Montevideo, isn't it Montevideo? Montevideo, Montevideo, <coughs> one of the best names ever. Uh, Can sort of Maine, Chicago, loads of people in the USA. Anyway, keep saying hello over there. So what are we going to have a look at? SLU members around the world come together tonight to watch a near-Earth asteroid, a potentially hazardous asteroid, no less. Now, I'm just going to clear my screen because we've got the first mission should be starting. So let's just, uh, hopefully you can uh, just tell me in chat, everybody, if you can actually see my screen, we should be looking at the SLU website. The first thing we've got to do is look to see uh, the conditions at the observatory. So I'm going to click the uh, old observatory button. We can see Chile 1 is online, Chile 2 is online, Canary is offline. Let's go over, have a look, see what is wrong with Canary Islands. Uh, the forecast was a bit dodgy uh, tonight. Oh, there we can see it. We can see we've got some cloud here in the all sky. Now, actually, I'm going to ask uh, our operations manager, Andrew Dumbleton, to keep a very close eye on that because with such a clear area of the sky there, we might be lucky. Images might be horrible. So I think, Andrew, we'd only open up Canary 2 because that's the only uh, telescope we've scheduled there. But uh, those clouds are moving really fast. That's why they're looking a bit streaky there. Oh, look at that. There's, uh, there's a constellation of Scorpius there just rising. Uh, in the east, uh, domes one and two over there. Uh, let's have a quick look, actually, see what else we've got. 
Uh, so we can hop down actually and we can see what the forecast was for tonight here. And we've got a slight chance of high humidity, so there weren't any clouds uh, forecast there. So with any luck, uh, we may be uh, okay. Well, that's interesting. Uh, I've got an annotate thing. Uh, shall we uh, clear that? Didn't even realize that was on there. Do excuse me, didn't realize I was doing that. Uh, anyway, uh, right. So we've got, uh, let's just have a look. We've got no moonlight, of course, tonight, which is pretty good. Um, the moon is, uh, is setting here. We can see in about uh, another hour and 15 minutes, something like that. So did we see that actually in the all sky? I didn't see that in the all sky. I didn't see it in the all sky. So hasn't arisen yet. Oh yeah, there it is. So you can just see it behind that cloud. That's why it wasn't so noticeable. But we did see there that Chile 1 was open. So let's go over Chile 1 and Chile 2 actually is one that we've scheduled tonight. Let's have a look, see if we have got the astro. There it is. I can see it. Can you see it, folks? I can see the asteroid. Right, what are we looking at here then? We're looking at a star field. By the way, uh, everybody, uh, just as, re just as a reminder, if you have got any questions for us tonight as we go through, post them uh, in the chat. That's not SLU chat, that's the Zoom uh, call chat. And I am, you know, because we've got lots of people here tonight, which is absolutely brilliant, isn't it? I love, I love that we've got so many people here. Um, because we've got that, um, I would love it if uh, the folks um, at SLU can send me through any questions that I may miss because I'm, I'm trying to keep my eye on so many things. First time we've done one of these. Anyway, look, here we go. I'm going to snap an image here and I would recommend that you do as well. So just press that little camera button up the top. Anybody, I, I know we've got loads of new members uh, who have joined up actually for uh, the International Space Station yesterday, crossing the face of the sun. How cool was that? But also for tonight to see this near Earth asteroid 1998 uh, OR2. And we can see it here already. Now, if you snap an image, which I've just done there, it will be easier for me to point out the actual asteroid to you. Um, we're we're, we're going to look at these images in more detail. But if you snap images of every mission, what we'll do maybe uh, during another star party, if anybody's interested, is learn how to create a time-lapse animation of all the images. So anyway, here we're looking at one of the images from the live stream from the the, the Chile 2 17-inch telescope. That's the new telescope that came online a couple of months ago. Are we pleased with that, SLU members? I think we are, aren't we? Anyway, look, I think most of us are aware that most of the objects that we can see in this image that I've just snapped are stars, all right? So uh, can you guys see my uh, cursor? I don't know if you can see my yep. cursor. So I see tell it. me in chat yeah well, I actually heard somebody then gosh actually, that's, that's cool uh so look here, all of these things here are stars so you know the larger ones are brighter the smaller ones are tiny i'm actually looking to see if we've got any galaxies um or any other types of object in this particular image i can just see up here there's a tiny little smudge um so that's definitely not a star uh, so that could be a background galaxy. So all of the stars that we're seeing in this image are in the Milky Way galaxy. But the object that we're really looking at or hunting tonight is far, far closer to home. It's in the solar system. And in fact, it's goddamn close today. Sorry, I shouldn't say that. I'm not allowed to say that. Um, but anyway, look, there's this little object here. Can you see all of these stars are nice and round? Right. Perfect little stars because Chile 2 telescope is really performing well. But this little one here is long. I'm going to snap another image here and let's take another look at this. Let's see if we can zoom in on it. I'm going to uh, open that in a new tab, which is what I normally do. And then we'll zoom it there. You can see that a bit better, can't you? Look, this little white blob is not round. That is our asteroid. There is the first image that we've snapped of near-Earth asteroid 1998 OR2. Now, maybe talk if anybody's interested in uh, knowing how these things are named or anything like that. 
uh, then we can look at that a little bit later. But why is it long and the stars around it? Well, this asteroid is moving fast, very fast. Um, in fact, uh, there's a great uh, observation. Let's just take a quick look at uh, an observation which is uh, on the home page. And this was from Cameron McEwing. He's uh, one of our members down in New Zealand. Hopefully Cameron is joining us uh, tonight. Um, but I'm um, just gonna, so it's moving my screen around and things are taking a bit, bit of time to load as well tonight. So, cause I'm doing lots of things. But anyway, so 1998, OR2. This is a near Earth asteroid. It's a potentially hazardous asteroid. It's classified as an Amor asteroid. We can go into all of that if, if you're interested later. It was discovered on the 24th of July, 1998. Uh, but in fact, after it was discovered, they looked back over previous uh, observations um, and they, the, the first what's called pre-covery image, which was uh, taken from Siding Springs in Australia, I think, that was made in 1987. So we've actually been tracking this thing for donkey's years, over 32 years or something. But anyway, let's we were talking about the speed of this thing. So I'm just going to flick through all of the really cool observations. Uh, that's a new one. Oh, that looks Italian. Uh, I have noticed actually we've got some some great uh, foreign language. Um, where is it? It's in here somewhere, isn't it? Did somebody see Cameron's post today? Where is it? I don't think it was this far back. Uh, by the way, uh, welcome to the viewers uh, um, who have joined us from india.slu.com. Uh, and also, I think we've got some of our uh, Nordic Swedish um, SLU members joining us tonight as well at sweden.slu.co. But look, here's this observation. I wanted to share with you. So this is from Cameron, and he quite rightly has called this a hypersonic Mount Etna. as uh, a typo, never. Uh, Mount Etna, because so, this thing is about the size of Mount Etna. And if we let's, let's just take a little close up look at this. And you can see here, Cameron in his uh, delightful way, Cameron always presents his images beautifully has marked the date and time of the asteroid moving. Now tonight it's moving a lot quicker than it was for him because it's a lot closer. But that's its apparent speed which is changing. And you can see here as well, this is this is really important. This little animation up at the top left actually, we'll talk about this later if you want. This is really, really important because when an asteroid like this comes so close to Earth, it comes within the range of our radio telescopes and in this particular case the Arecibo uh, radio telescope uh, which is my favorite thing because it's in my favorite film Contact. Um, it falls within the range of radio telescopes and they can use radar and radio waves to make this kind of observation from it and this means that when they come this close we can determine how big they are and the shape they are and up until this approach we didn't know how big this thing was before the range was, I think as Cameron's got here. Oh no, he has got the up updated one, I think here. Um, but the range was something like between um, 1.3 kilometers to four kilometers, yeah, which is a huge size range because the only thing that we could actually measure it on uh, was the object's apparent magnitude, its brightness. But as soon as it comes within the range of radar, as it's done now, we can tell very, very specifically because we know what distance the object is and we can measure it very accurately. So what Arecibo were able to do last week was pin the size of this asteroid down incredibly well. It's two kilometers in diameter, 1.2 miles, that is. But the speed of this thing is 8.7 kilometers per second. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not up on kilometers and imagining kilometers per second, I don't know, it, it's not really a, a unit that I know very much about. Um, let's go, let's just hop back actually to the live feeds because I need to snap another image. So I'm going back over to Chile too. And uh, we'll see it load up here. Look at, look, look at this, the sky conditions over here. This is the all sky over here on there. Look, you can see already the asteroid has moved since our last mission. Oh, did I miss? catching that last, no, I just managed to catch, a, catch that last snap. 
I understand miles per hour pretty well because I'm a bit of a petrol head. This thing is traveling with a relative velocity of 19,461 miles per hour. That's why we're seeing it as a little line because during the long exposure that we take, these are taken at 50 second exposures to provide the live stream. The asteroid is moving during that period of time, whereas the stars are fixed in the background. Now, this is not moving that fast. In fact, for the entire hour, I've stayed on the same star field. If anybody's interested, by the way, um, in knowing how to set up coordinate missions, we might do some of that at the, at the end of the show, um, at the end of the, the star party. Um, but anyway, it's a lot of the near-Earth asteroids that we've tracked over the years have been a lot more closer to us than this one. And that usually means that their apparent speed is a lot, lot faster. In other words, they can whiz across the, the, the field of view of the telescope within a minute or so. But how far away is this object tonight? Well, it's close approach tomorrow morning. So we're about uh, nine, yeah, between nine and 10 hours away from when it is closest to Earth. At closest approach, it's gonna be about 6.2. Uh, million kilometers uh, from Earth. That's uh, 3.9 million miles. So it's a long old way, isn't it? Um, and that's, but we're still seeing it moving against the background stars like this. So uh, what else have we talked about as far as it? Oh, by the way, I, I noticed something today when I was looking this up, that um, it shares something in common with the moon. So there's a challenge for you lot who are watching. Uh, tell me what this near earth asteroid has in common uh, with the moon. It has something to do with its physical characteristics and orbit and stuff like that. But uh, anyway, this is not the closest approach that this, uh, this thing's gonna make. Um, in, I think it's 2079 now, I happen to know that we've got quite a few uh, of our school students watching tonight. We're going to uh, talk to, to, to Russ Glenn, our Director of Education, actually, in a few minutes' time, because uh, he's got an update on who's watching. I, I know we've got a lot of classrooms watching tonight. And uh, some of you guys might still be alive. I'm not sure I'm going to see the 2017 close approach. And that's when it comes within 1.8 million kilometres. That is incredibly close to Earth for such a large object. Hey, Divya is saying from India, um, does it have in common with the moon a lack of atmosphere? Well, that is one thing that it's got in common with the moon. Uh, but uh, the one I'm thinking about no, is not right. quite. We're By the way, you think orbits of the sun in 3.68 years. Um, so it's fairly speedy, comes around every time. But uh, these close approaches, have to kind of coincide with the eccentricity of its orbit and stuff like that. I'm just going to check, see if we've got any questions. So uh, I hope you are snapping images, everybody. Um, uh, so listen, if you have got questions tonight, post them in chat, or if you've got um, if you've got some ideas, yeah. same reflectivity. Greg is saying same reflectivity as them. Now that one, I don't actually know. Greg, but there's a really interesting little thing um, that, that kind of pertains to what I was just talking about there, about knowing how big this thing was. So until we had those great radar observations where we could really measure to a high degree of accuracy how big it was, how did we make that estimate of its size before 1.3 to um, 4 kilometers or whatever? Um, that's what I did. So, actually, I'm just, I'm just having a look. I might, I might pose this. Okay, I'm going to pose this question actually to all of you. How did we determine the estimate for this asteroid's size before we had those radar observations? So it was something like a huge range between 1.3 and 4.1 kilometers in diameter, or something like that. How do you think 
we made those estimates before. And bear in mind, that was on the back of Greg's comment there, does it have the same reflectivity as the moon? Another word for reflectivity is uh, albedo when it comes to these things. So uh, but, uh, anyway, uh, let's have a, let's have another look. Our telescope's able to lock on to an object like this asteroid and follow it without manual manipulation. That's an interesting one, actually. Uh, so that was from Mayor West X. Um, hey, Mayor West X, I wonder where you're from. Tell us where you're from, talking from. Um, in fact, I wonder, shall we? Would you like to um, ask that question and kind of give me more detail about that question if we uh, can get you unmuted? Mayor, can you do that? Just move on. I don't want to hear it from these people. I don't care what they have to say. <laughs> Thanks, Jack. Move on yourself. Sure, um, <laughs> yes. So uh, anyway, uh, Mayor, if you can uh, unmute, then do. Otherwise, I will. Oh, uh, so you're from Texas. Can you unmute and uh, ask that question? doesn't sound like we can so listen let me let, let me answer it anyway what we've done tonight is we have specifically fixed the field of view so when i set up all of these missions for the chile 2 telescope i used the same coordinates for all of the missions over the entire hour right so the fixed stars are going to be there and what we've already seen is the asteroid has moved from top right and it's coming down to the center because I chose the coordinates that the asteroid was gonna be in the center of our field of view at the time, at halfway through our hour, all right? So let's see how accurate we are in 10 minutes time, nine minutes time. Let's see if the asteroid is in the center of the field of view. Um, and then it's gonna carry on going down. Now I could, oh, Andrew Dumbleton's just said Canary 2 is up and running. Oh, 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 oh. Uh, you know me, I'm like a dog seeing a rabbit. Let's hop over to the Canary 2 wide field. Let's have a look. It's showing us uh, the difference in field of view between the Chile 2 wide field and the Canary 2 wide field. And it just so happens that both of these telescopes are identical. Oh, we got some nasty lines in here. This is because of the clouds that we've got here. Uh, we've got some bad pixel columns always show up worse but there we can see in this image all right let's snap an image of this i've got to do this uh hi daniel cronus uh so uh, hi everyone uh, uh, tell us where you're where you're all watching from won't you so we can see here then uh let's let's open up the image a little bit larger we can see here there is the asteroid right in the center of the field uh, in this particular image. So we're, we've got this kind of gradient and let's take a look actually at the all sky camera. So if we just scroll down here, here we, here we can see why we've got these strange gradients. Look, we've only opened the one dome. Uh, we can see the moon setting over there uh, to the west and we can see all of this cloud. But I still think it's worthwhile because we can see the asteroid. But actually what I really want to do is I'm just going to do something because I wanted to show you something which I thought was quite cool. I'm going to hop back over to the Chile 2 wide field telescope. So uh, make sure that you do uh, snap images from both of these telescopes, won't you? So um, here we go. Let's take a look at this. So I'm going to snap an image of this and open this up. Now then, let's compare these two images. So this is the one from Chile. Look, we've got a nice bright, uh, sorry, this is the one from the Canary Islands. We've got a nice bright star there. We've got two bright stars down here. Let's see if we can see those particular stars in here. There's the bright star there, and there are the two bright stars there. So what we've got at the same time, but from two different locations, let's have a look at this stream. So what we're doing here is we're, locating, we're, we're spotting a pattern of stars so we can see where the asteroid appears in each image. So I'm just look, looking at this line, look, there's a row of four, and then it's very close to this bright star here. Let's go back to the Canary Islands one. Look, it's a, it's a lot further away. 
So there's that stream of stars that I just looked at here. Hopefully you can see it on my cursor. Look, there's that little line, kind of a little squiggly line, uh, kind of like a, an F um, there. But the asteroid is down here in comparison to those stars. Let's go back to the chilly one. There is that line of stars and the asteroid is right on the end of it. The asteroid appears to be in two different places at the same time. Now, slewers, there's a lot of experts out there. Tell me what the term is that this is an absolute classic illustration of. Um, I, I, I only realized that we were gonna be able to do this when I set up the missions and I was looking at a star chart software and I thought, oh, all right, okay, so it's in a slightly different That's position. parallax. <laughs> it is, who said that? Jeffrey. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and, Daniel, and Daniel said it as well. Hi, Jeffrey, where are you talking from, man? Uh, from Kensington, Maryland. <laughs> right, and, and for those of us who don't have any USA geography, whereabouts is that in the USA? That's close to Washington, DC. Okay, so uh, how long have you been a SLU member then? Because I haven't seen you in the community before. Well, I'm kind of off and on. I guess I, I've, I, my membership lapsed and then I renewed it, I don't know, a couple of months ago. <laughs> well, welcome back. You chose a brilliant time to come back because had the Chile 2, the new Chile 2 17-inch telescope uh, launched, had it come online before you rejoined or was it after? No, I think it was not online at, and when I f first joined again, renewed, yeah. Oh, so you had the joy of this brand new telescope. And we, I'll tell you, we, we've had some absolutely, you know, such in, enjoyment out of that single telescope, the observations that are coming out of it all together. So, Jeffrey, without putting you on the spot, because you knew that straight away, this term parallax, can you, I am putting you on the spot, and on the spot so don't worry if you can't answer it but can you explain to the other slew members who are watching in what parallax is well it's it you know the classic thing when you when you take astro an introductory astrophysics class so you you close one eye and look at your finger with your your arm out and then you close the other eye and, and it appears that your finger moves <laughs> so yeah. You're, so it's a, a different so point of view. We all do, if, if we all did that now, I'm holding my looking finger now, and I'm looking at where my fingernail is in some in relation to position with one eye, and then I look at it with my other eye, and it's no longer in the same place. So where would the analogy be? My fingernail would be the asteroid. How about my eyes, what would that be representing in those two images that we well, just saw? Well, there, there's a geographic separation of the, of the apertures of the, the two telescopes. That's right. I mean, we, I, I don't know. Somebody might be able to tell us actually what is the distance. I've never worked it out between Chile um, and the Canary Islands. But that's exactly what we're able to see. And actually, I don't know if you can see, folks, on the screen at the moment, we've got a photo bombing object in our field of view at the moment. So just above center, we can see that slightly longish looking white spot. That is our asteroid 1998 uh, OR2. But can you see there's that diagonal line, um, just kind of lower right of center. In fact, why don't I point to it with my cursor? We've never been able to do this before. What's that folks? Uh, slew members, long time slew members will know these. Um, some will curse them of course, because they spoil an image. In fact, I'm gonna snap an image of that because it's all always quite good to uh, snap an old one like that. But we do have other members who actually track this particular type of object down. And actually they're in the news quite a lot uh, over the last couple of weeks. Oh, by the way, Jeffrey, thank you so much for that explanation of parallax. Uh, how Daniel, uh, how saying it's a, a satellite? Yes, it is. So. Here's a great demonstration of the 50 second exposure that's generated this image in our image stream. So we can see how far the asteroid has apparently moved through our field of view over that 50 seconds versus something which is way, way closer to us, an artificial satellite, probably in low earth orbit. And that's how fast that satellite has moved during that 50 second exposure.
which is quite cool. I think that's a nice little demonstration. So uh, anyway, oh, oh, we have got some questions that I have missed. Um, L Gibbs 421, hello, just logged on. What am I looking at and where is the asteroid? Right, okay, that's really cool because a new mission has just started, so it's perfectly timed. Um, right, so we've got, oh, look, that is, that is brilliant, isn't it? Because we've still got that satellite. So you can see the satellite line here has moved on. So that's by the time the next 50 seconds uh, exposure, long exposure is done, then that's going to be out of the way. But just above centre, you can see this little uh, slightly longish line. So let's snap an image of that and we can take a look at it a little bit larger. So let's, uh, this is how I always do. I always right click on that and then open in a new uh, page. So here we can see there's our satellite down here. All of these beautifully round uh, white dots are stars. The focus is looking absolutely brilliant on this. So, but here we can see there's one white object which isn't round. And that's our asteroid. That is 1998 02 OR2. Right? It's actually got a longer name that we'll talk about a bit later. Um, but there it is. And what we've been seeing so far is at the top of the show, it started up here and it's tracking through. We're halfway through the show, so it's roughly in the center. And then for the remaining half an hour, it's gonna track down left. So uh, let's have a look. We got another question here um, from Heidi Roo. Hi, Heidi. Uh, which is bigger, today's asteroid or Umarua? Uh, so this is, isn't this one of the interstellar objects? Now, I don't know the answer to that question, but I bet you there's some SLU members in chat who can answer that. So in fact, somebody is already doing it. It's a small object. So Andrew Dumbleton's saying it's a small object uh, between a hundred and a, a thousand meters. So what we know after these radar observations were made of the uh, asteroid, this asteroid 1998 OR2. Uh, we know that it's about two kilometers uh, in diameter. That's about 1.2 miles. So uh, Umamau, I think is the way you pronounce it. I'm never sure. I think we did this on another show, didn't we? And I couldn't pronounce it then. Um, that is about half the size, at least half the size of this. So we've got some other questions, kind of looks like you know, from distance. Jackson Pessis, um, how close will the asteroid get to Earth? Right, so the asteroid makes its actual closest approach um, tomorrow morning at 0956 UTC. So that is in about nine, nine and a half hours time. Actually, no, it's, it's not, it's about uh, 10 and a half hours time. Um, and it's going to be, uh, if you want it precisely, 6,290,365 kilometers uh, away from Earth. That's a 3.9 uh, million miles away. So this is really quite a distant pass for a near Earth asteroid, but it's a very close pass for such a large near Earth asteroid. And this one is also designated a potentially hazardous asteroid. And it's got that designation because of its size and how close it can get to Earth. But uh, hey, listen, I want to, uh, we're a little bit uh, late. I wanted to uh, call in, oh, head on. oh, right, I didn't even know my video was on. That's just as when I was behaving. So uh, I was using all my bandwidth actually for the screen share. So thank you very much for that. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, what else have we got? Right, I am going to uh, invite in, hopefully uh, Russ Glenn is around. Now Russ is our director of education because uh, Russ, uh, we've done some shout outs for um, everybody watching in India. My, my word, it's, it's something like 4.30 or, 5 a.m. in the morning over there. Um, we've also got um, folks from sweden.slu.com watching tonight, but I know that Russ has got some news of some of our school classes in uh, our, our education um, program. Russ, are you there? 
Yeah, Paul, right here. This is hey, great. Hey, Russ. Good How are you? What, what, do you? what do you think of the live images that we've got tonight, first of all? Oh, it's been phenomenal. This has been, this has been wonderful. And, and it's fun seeing all the, the members here in the chat. And, uh, you know, we've got 4,000 people watching on YouTube. So I uh, hope you guys are doing great, enjoying the show. Brilliant. So anyway, Russ, you've got a whole bunch of schools watching tonight, haven't you? Who have we got watching tonight? Yeah, so, so a couple of them. We got Allen Academy. They're from Texas. So mm -hmm. Allen Academy, big shout out to you guys. Uh, Kent's Hill School. I know you guys are out there too. You're, they're from Maine. They gave us a nice uh, shout out on uh, social media earlier, Instagram. So, you know, anybody who's on social media wants to bring some people in to uh, seeing this show, let them know. Send something out. Uh, make sure you, you let them know what, what's going on here at SLU. Um, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and, and talking of that, um, loads of people homeschooling at the moment and actually quite a few schools are also setting up a lot of remote classes and stuff like that, which kind of dovetails pretty nicely, doesn't it, into what you're doing at SLU, Russ, you know, with our education programs. What have we got? Because I, I think there's also one, there's another um, program that we run called Astronomy Club, which a lot of astronomy clubs are not meeting physically at the moment, obviously, because, you know, social distancing, which is actually what this asteroid is doing quite nicely for us tonight. It's, <laughs> it's social distancing from Earth, which is very considerate of it. Um, but uh, yeah, we've got um, an astronomy club um, program as well, haven't we? Yes, uh, it's, a, it's a great program. And, and it's, it, you know, schools can do it. Uh, also, private astronomy clubs can, can do it. And what you get is you'll get a private astronomy club account on SLU. Uh, you'll get access to all of the telescope feeds, all the guides, all the shows, um, and it's fantastic. And you'll also have your own clubhouse to, uh, you know, share club news, share uh, success, and enjoy the enjoy learning about space together. Um, cool. Also, along with that, everybody's going to have uh, access to all of our quests. So, Ooh, you know, yeah. we got some amazing quests uh, that have been uh, a lot of love and a lot of work has been put into them. Uh, there are make for uh, a really fun way to enjoy learning about space. Uh, we got a couple of new ones coming online here in the next week or so. Uh, we got a seasons quest and a Messier object quest. So, uh, you know, that's in addition to all the other fantastic quests that we have. Russ, what, what's, what's the Messier quest? What's Messier about then? It's a collection quest, isn't it? Yes, yes, you're gonna you're gonna be challenged to go out and and uh, follow in the footsteps of Messier and, and discover all the objects and collect those objects into your own account. Uh, and just like a lot of our quests, you're you're building up your own image collection uh, and you're completing uh, in, uh, guide guidelines of your own. So uh, it's a fantastic way to, to learn about all those objects and a fantastic way to explore space. Brilliant. I and the the Messier. Messier catalog, what is it, 110 of, frankly, some of the best celestial objects out there. Uh, hey, listen, uh, it looks like the Canary Islands has cleared a bit. I've just switched over here to the uh, Canary 2 telescope. And uh, what did you think of this, this demonstration, Russ, of parallax, which, which Jeffrey kind of really explained well to us, that, you know, if we look at... Um, Let's just snap an image here. Um, and I love, so I love it. It's fantastic whenever you get to to get your body involved in in learning about space. So uh, Jeffrey's description of parallax is fantastic. It is it is the classic one, but it's it you know those things are classic for a reason. Uh, it really gets the point across. We're all familiar with with parallax because we've seen what happens when we close our eyes at, at you know at different times. So yeah, fantastic uh, uh, demonstration. I love it. I, I, th I think this would be a great one for one of your online lessons, actually, that we, we can find a, a fairly nearby object and be observing them from Chile and the Canary Islands Observatory at the same time. Um, and uh, that, would be, uh, that would be a great little demonstration of that. And you haven't got to wait six months because normally parallax is kind of measured when the Earth changes position rather than two different telescopes and stuff, isn't it? That's right. That's right. Yeah. You don't want to have to wait the six months. Although, you know, with SLU, you could, you could wait those six months and, and you'd get a really great understanding of parallax in that, in that regard. Exactly. I do want to mention one thing, Paul, uh, before oh, yes, I go, yes. Yes, is yes. that, uh, you know, um, if you're a scout, we just, we have a new thing coming online for Cub Scouts. Um, 
if you're a Cub Scout and you're interested in earning the Out of This World Nova Award, you can do it with SLU. So uh, you can check out the lesson plan on the Facebook page, STEM Nova Award BSA. So we're really excited about this. Love getting those scouts out, exploring space, and um, looking forward to hearing, hearing more from the Boy Scouts in the future. Brilliant. Well, we look forward to that. Uh, hey, Russ, thank you so much um, for joining us. And you're going to stick around for the rest of the star party anyway. And um, you better believe it. You better believe it. Cheers, Paul. This is, this is fun. That's great. Cheers, mate. Thank you very much. See you soon. Wow. Uh, we are so excited about our education products and the fact that we've got, you know, lots of schools and lots of students, you know, at this terrible time, you know, where frankly, you know, learning in school is, is, is disrupted so much. But here we are around the world. Goodness knows we've we've seen so many people um, introducing themselves and saying where they're from tonight. You know, here we are meeting at our second SLU star party. Hey, listen, we've got some other questions that have come up. Keep snapping images. I'm going to hop back to the Chile 2 um, telescope. Here we go. Let's just have a look down at the sky conditions. Sky conditions are looking rather good. So here's the all-sky camera. Uh, here we can see um, Scorpius uh, rising over here in the east. We can see the moon. Uh, which will be out of the way, thankfully. There's the dome up at the top. That's the SLU dome. This is the uh, university, the Catholic University's huge roll-off roof observatory, which unfortunately isn't used uh, that much. But look, even with this bright moonlight, we can see the Milky Way stretching across it. Oh, we can see Orion over here setting over to the west. So actually, that's a good indicator. You know, we're still at fairly the... the, the um, we're still um, at, the, at the time of year um, when we're sorry, we are at the beginning of the night in Chile and Orion is already setting low. So if you're new to SLU and we've got loads of new members, so welcome to you uh, watching tonight. If you have not captured the celestial gems in Orion, the Orion Nebula, the Flame Nebula, the Horsehead Nebula, a whole stack more in there as well. If you haven't captured those yet, make sure you capture them soon before Orion starts getting too low. Um, hey, Donna from Arizona has uh, joined us. Uh, hey, listen, we've got a question from Divya in India. Uh, Divya, can you hear me? Can you ask the question in person? Why not? Sure. Uh, hi, Paul. And hey, hi. Divya. So uh, I have a question, actually. Uh, I know there are several ways in avoiding the asteroid impact on Earth in case of it is happening. And uh, if nuking, uh, nuking, colliding it with other satellites and, you know, some other techniques, te techniques like electromagnetic gravity stuff to change its course, no? there are so many options, like, you know, to uh, prevent the collision. But, you know, which of these prevention methods will be uh, with high success rate or like, you know, which is effective method for avoiding an asteroid? That is rather interesting. And um, back in, ooh, time flies when you get old. Back in 2013, I think it was, NASA invited us to get involved, invited SLU to get involved with their Asteroid Grand Challenge. And we were doing that to get uh, lots of members like you lot out there uh, tracking near-Earth asteroids, because uh, lots of people discover them, but very few people actually track them afterwards. Um, but it also, that whole program included NASA's desire to capture and redirect an asteroid. Um, and basically, when we were there, we met loads of, um, wow, rocket scientists, basically. I mean, th these guys were Absolutely. I mean, a, a, a league of intelligence that I've never come across before, literally rocket scientists. And there were two main ways, and, and these groups are from around the world, and there were two main strategies to try and deflect an asteroid, um, which was found to be uh, on a, a an orbit that would allow it to impact Earth. There was one called the deflection 
strategy, which is also called diversion. But the other one was destruction. So destruction is, is really the, the Hollywood version of what we do with an asteroid. The diversion and deflection thing, a whole stack of ways uh, they, they came up with to do that. You know, like those big solar sails. I don't know if you've seen uh, illustrations of that, these kind of huge mylar shiny sails that they'd attach to an asteroid and hope that the, the sun's solar wind would blow the sail and move the asteroid away. Um, there was something called a kinetic impactor, I think it was, I think that was the term. And that was basically driving a really high velocity object, very much like this asteroid itself. In fact, I think they were talking about the same kind of speeds. They were talking about hurtling an object, a spacecraft or something like that, at incredible speed, 22,000 miles an hour or something, and ramming that into the asteroid, which would deflect it, um, but not very much. They, there were also some really weird things using uh, what's called the Yarkovsky Yarkov, effect. And that one was painting an asteroid. And, and frankly, when I heard some of this stuff, I thought, really, really, is that practical when we're talking about an asteroid hurtling towards Earth? So we basically got to get, you know, tons of titanium oxide paint, get it up to the asteroid, paint this thing, and then the hope was that radiation pressure from the sun's light would actually move the asteroid. And it would, in theory, it would. And there were things like putting little spacecraft up to the asteroid and putting ion thrusters pointing at the asteroid to kind of blow it off course. Now, all of those diversion and deflection strategies, Divya, were, they all work in theory, but the problem is, they move the asteroid tiny, tiny amounts. So it has to be done over an incredibly long period of time, right? Um, I'm just gonna snap another image and I'm gonna flick over to see what the Canary Islands is uh, looking like as well. I'm gonna snap an image there as well. Uh, do excuse me. So what you have to do is you have to um, actually discover these asteroids years in advance to be able to then get spacecraft or whatever it is the kinetic impact to, to the asteroid to actually start doing that thing now the problem is the further away these things are the more difficult they are to discover that's why we tend to discover the large ones and the large ones that come close to us several um, asteroids near earth asteroids have actually impacted earth and then been discovered afterwards in previous images um, but anyway I digress slightly. So there we are at NASA. There was this one group of people. It was a, a group from Japan. And they, their strategy was destruction. They were taking the Hollywood approach. And the Hollywood approach was basically getting some nuclear weapons up there to blast the asteroid bits. Now, there were two ways of doing that. There's either a surface or subsurface way of doing this. You know, one is you explode it on the top. The other one, I think, uh, tell me in chat, which movie was it? Was it Armageddon where they drill in so that they can put the nuclear weapon inside the asteroid and blast it a bit some inside? But that one, would you believe, Divya, was actually the only practical solution for the vast majority of asteroids that were being discovered, because the asteroids that were being discovered were usually making their close approaches to Earth within months or weeks, or sometimes even days of making their close approach. So if one of those had been on an impact course to Earth, a nuclear weapon would have been the only way of mitigating that impact um, in the amount of time that we had. But frankly, we don't even know whether or not we can do that. Because would you believe there's no international cooperation about this? And in fact, the nuclear treaties or the space treaties actually forbid you putting, um, putting nuclear weapons into space. But uh, anyway, does that kind of answer the question, Divi? I know you're a bit of a, um, a catastrophe film fan. Yeah. 
<laughs> thank you thank you for that that totally answered my question thank you and you're right what <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Uh, listen, folks, if you have got any questions, we've got 10 minutes left of this star party, the second star party. If anybody has got any other questions, then uh, throw them in uh, to the Zoom chat. Um, a couple of here. Uh, can I be in the Astronomy Club? Uh, yeah, you can. You can join Astronomy Clubs. In fact, we've got all of our clubs. Um, if you hop over, um, to the menu in here, you can pop over. We've just consolidated some of these. So, you know, uh, you can join any of the clubs here. Uh, so if, by the way, you are interested um, to join, um, let's say, our, oh, the Comet Trackers is a great one. If you're interested in Comets, then hop over to there. But if you're a new member, you can browse through the clubs. If you're an astronomer member, then very uh, suitable for tonight's um, subject. We hop down here, the A team. Now the A team are our group of citizen scientists who track near earth objects and comets every night using the telescopes. Um, so uh, that's, uh, you know, that's, that would be a good club to use, but come on, let's hop back over. Let's just, uh, for anybody who's joined a bit late, let's take a quick look um, at our latest images coming through. So here we are, we're using the Chile 2 telescope. Our sky conditions are great. We're looking over here at the, uh, the all sky camera. Um, and here we can see the fixed stars in the background. And here we can see our asteroid here. So let's snap an image. We can open the image. And then if we actually open this up in another tab, we can kind of zoom in on it a bit. And there is our asteroid that little long line, which is just about to pass very, very close in front of that star. So we have got some other questions that I will deal with. Let's have a look. Um, there's, a, there's a good one here. Um, Riley, you can um, click on any of the, um, on the club join, there's a little um, join button on there, but Andrea Perino, hi, Andrea. Uh, let, let let us know in um, in uh, in chat where you're watching from. Um, but yeah, we can. She's she's asking how are asteroids named, and that's quite a good one actually. Um, nice little question. Um, and I will go through this really really quickly. Now, the asteroid that we're looking at tonight. So that little white streak that we're seeing moving against the background stars. Its full name is 52768 brackets, 1998 OR2 closed brackets, right? Most people have been referring to it as 1998 OR2. Now that actually was its provisional designation when it was first discovered in 1998. Now, when uh, the orbit is determined well enough, that usually takes a few years before that's done. They're then assigned a specific number, and that number was the 52768. But what does the 1998 OR2 stand for? So how is that name, you know, conjured up? Well, the first four numbers, um, no guesses here, that's the year of discovery, because we know that it was discovered in 1998. Now, the other characters denote when in the year it was discovered. So in this case, the first letter, um, the O, uh, is the half month. Now, in this particular case, so when I say that, A would be the first two weeks of January, B would be the second two weeks of January. So the first letter denotes the half month. So in this particular case, it's O, and that was actually corresponds to the second half of July. So we know it was discovered in the second half of July. The second letter, in this case, R, now that denotes the order of discovery, and one letter matches 25 asteroids because uh, the letter I isn't used, right? And then the, the number should actually be subscript. You don't often see it written properly, but it should be subscript. And the two is basically telling us how many cycles of the 25 letters have gone through. So. Any member who can work that out in the last six minutes of the show, 
gets prized. Can't tell you what the prize is. It might be a signed photograph of um, my dog, for example. All right. Um, but try try that out. See if you can work that out after, after that description. So 1998, we know that. That's easy. We know it was in the second half of July, the last two weeks of July. Use the R and the two to work out what order, what number that discovery was in that period of time. So hopefully, Andrea, that answers that question. I, I love that. It took me ages to get my head around that. Um, all right, just having a look for some more questions. By the way, in future star parties, we are just getting used to all of this. And what we really want to be able to do is to people, in fact, we've got a new system in Zoom where you're going to be able to put your hand up and say, hey, listen, I've got a question and we'll bring you on. And you can ask the question rather than have to type it in chat because it kind of gives game away then, doesn't it? So um, Aiden, age eight uh, from Kerry Bowring wants to know how asteroids are made. Well, most asteroids are kind of the leftover building blocks of our solar system. So our solar system formed in this huge dust cloud and its own gravity kind of collapsed it all in. The sun formed in the center of that and left a big dusty, rubbly disk around it, out of which all of the planets formed. But there was one area where they all those bits of rubble didn't kind of form a planet and that was between Mars and Jupiter and that's the asteroid belt. Now most of these near-earth asteroids aren't in the asteroid belt. They're whizzing around the solar system all over the place just like this one is tonight that we're looking at. And But most of them came from the asteroid belt so they may have collided with another asteroid in the asteroid belt and got thrown out of the asteroid belt and then formed their own orbits around the sun. Some of them also maybe came uh, from outside of Jupiter's orbit as well. So anyway, Aiden, basically these asteroids are just rubble left over. They're the leftover building blocks of our solar system, which I think is really quite cool. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, and uh, in fact, uh, loads of people said that it was a great question. Thank you, Aiden, for that. Um, so uh, we've got another one, uh, Sagar from India. Sagar, well done for getting up so early or maybe you stayed up late uh, may i ask you this question how do you really recognize the asteroid you were looking at it's really 1998 or2 uh, is it by expected path using some mass calculation shape and size or something else well i look up in fact i can show you very very oh, quickly clear. here uh, this is uh, called the jpl horizons website and what we can pop in here um, I'm just going to show you very quickly how we find these coordinates because there was another question about it. So I'm just going to put in here the object's name. So you search for that. Um, I'm going to say, let's change the location uh, in here and just say SLU and it will come up with both of SLU's observatories. Let's use the Chile Observatory. And there's a date range. We can live with that. Um, and I'm just going to say generate ephemeris. And ephemeris is basically a list of times and dates and location coordinates. So if we scroll down here, what we can see is, uh, where are we now? We're on the 28th, uh, scrolling down, scrolling down, scrolling down. And we're somewhere around, you know, coming up to about midnight. So here we go. These are the coordinates at this particular date and time. Those are the coordinates. Um, of this particular object. So we've got uh, right ascension, which is 10 hours, 21 minutes, 22 seconds, and we've got a declination of minus 14. I think if we hop over here, look, we can see it's, is it the same? Did I get the right date? I wonder, um, minus 14. No, I've got the wrong date. So I, I think I'm slightly out there. I think we're, we should probably a uh, forward, 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 forward. Yeah, here we go. Um, so in fact, we are down here, I believe. So yeah, here we go. So this is this is close to timing here. So 10, 37, 13, minus 20. Have a look at my mission. Look, over here on the right hand side, there we go. There are those coordinates. So what I've done is we haven't seen another object or I haven't other than that satellite that's been moving in our image stream tonight. So here we go. Oh, this is a color image, folks. I, I scheduled two color, 
color images because what we can then see is um, if, if we look at the individual images and we'll do this in one of the clubs tomorrow, um, oh, did I, did, I just missed it. Um, we will see um, a red, green and blue line because during a color mission, we're taking images through different filters. So that's what's going on there. So we're gonna have a look at that. But anyway, this little white dot here is our asteroid. Um, and that's the only object that we've seen moving through. But that was where I got the coordinates from. So uh, where else have we got? Have we got any other questions coming up? Ooh, we got that. Um, yeah. Um, hi, Hema from India. Similar. Oh yeah, Carol Botha, we, I asked a question right at the beginning. Uh, this asteroid shares a characteristic to our moon. And the characteristic I was talking about was what's called its orbital declination, which just happens to be very, very close to our moons, which is about five degrees. So this is, if you can imagine, um, our solar system has an orbital plane and um, in relationship to Earth, our moon is our moon's orbit is tilted by six degrees, and the orbital um, uh, the orbital de um, what am I saying um, inclination of this asteroid is five point eight six degrees. So it's very very close. It's, its orbit is tilted at roughly the same as our moon. So uh, anyway, uh, right. What else have we got? Uh, looks like people are starting to go to bed. So I think, unless anybody can uh, chat to me from the SLU team, I think we might round up because we've got our last mission. I think we've got one more mission, uh, which is just starting. Uh, so let's just hop over to Canary 2. There we can see it. Look, it's all the way down here now. I'm so glad we opened up Canary 2. Did those clouds clear? How much have they cleared? Have we just been incredibly lucky? We have. Look at this. We've been so lucky that the asteroid has been slightly outside of uh, where that main cloud band is. So we've got another question here actually from Hema Vathi. Uh, hi Hema Vathi. Um, how do you differentiate other asteroids from that? Well, if they were appearing in the same image, you know, most of these asteroids, unless they're newly discovered, especially something like this that was discovered such a long time ago, we know its um, orbit incredibly precisely. So we know in comparison to the background stars exactly where this asteroid should be in relationship to those background stars. Now, sometimes we do get a lovely surprise when you're taking an image of one asteroid and you suddenly see um, another object moving in the image stream and you picked up another one. Um, so, and, but you can then, excuse me, <laughs> you can then track that down um, to see uh, what other asteroid would match its orbit now most most of the time most of the time you have to take more than one you have to make more than one observation of an asteroid probably three so that you can determine both its apparent speed across the sky and its direction as soon as you start doing that then you can start determining its orbit and then you can match it to another asteroid so, uh, Maya, uh, thank you very much. You've managed to stay with us for the whole duration of the star party. Are the stars in light? We're able to see permanent versus this asteroid, which is physically moving object in our system because they are dead flashes of light that have made it to us millions or billions of years ago. Uh, some people see. Just trying to work out the question. Sorry, so, that's, can you all hear me? Oh yes, we can. Hi, Maya. Yes, go on, <laughs> ask, ask away. It'll be a lot easier well, to, to ask it rather than read it. I just think it's fascinating that we're looking at the same permanent stars that all of our ancestors, that everybody's always looked at, it stays permanent. So I'm, I'm curious, is it permanent because they died millions and billions of years ago? So we're seeing these images of flashing lights from billions of years ago, and that's why they're not, they don't move. No, it's just because they're so far away. And in fact, the stars do move, but just over a very long period of time. So if you take the Big Dipper, look at the all sky image that we've got up at the moment. Can you see through the cloud? We've got the Big Dipper, the plow there at the top. There are some great animations on the internet 
that show how that constellation changes over hundreds of thousands of years. So because just about every single star in the Milky Way is moving and moving in relationship to each other. So the constellations do change. The dinosaurs would have seen some of these constellations different to how we're seeing them and future generations will say, but it's just that it happens over such a long period of time um, because they're so distant to us. We're seeing the asteroid move because it's so close to us. So it is literally just about the uh, distance away they are. So if you see a car whizzing past you on the street outside, going 30 miles an hour, it looks like it's going quite fast. If you see a car moving 30 miles an hour, but it's two miles away, it looks like it's moving fairly slowly. So it's exactly that same principle there. Wonderful, thank you. No problem. Uh, thank you so much for joining. How long have you been a SLU member, by the way? Today. <laughs> Today, oh brilliant, it's your first day. Have you been snapping images of I this have. asteroid? I've been going yeah. back and forth between the uh, Zoom meeting and then logged in on SLU and been snapping pictures. Brilliant, so what you gotta do tomorrow is if you go over to my photo hub, you'll be able to get all of your pictures. And because we've been fixed on this same field of view of stars, we haven't been tracking the asteroid, we've been watching the asteroid as it travels through our field of view. If you download some of your images and you can quite easily uh, on the internet, there are quite a few animated GIF makers. If you upload some of these images, what you'll see, so you can download them just by pressing that that button and download it to your um, device. You can animate them. And if you manage to catch images for the whole hour, you will see that rather large asteroid whizzing down from the top right of your images all the way down to the left. And it is really cool. And it's a lot, lot simpler than it may sound. So uh, maybe give that a go tomorrow. That'd be cool. Will do, I promise. And if you do that, upload it into my photo hub and then you can share it as an observation and then observations, shared observations, go on to the SLU homepage. So your image will be shared with the entire world. In fact, I wonder if anybody has uh, actually shared any images at the moment. So what, what are you most looking forward to actually um, in SLU? I mean, this is a kind of asteroid, but there's, it's not particularly photogenic. It's very interesting. But is there anything in particular that you're looking forward to seeing live in the telescopes? I'm not sure yet. I'm so excited to, just, to discover. And I know we have a star, my girlfriend and I have a star picked out, you know, one of those like ones you can name. So I know we can yeah, yeah. hold the telescope. So it'd be cool to see, I guess, that star live sometime. And then I definitely want to learn how to look into the sky and then watch some more shows. Okay, so you can you can do that easily and you can find your star. You can take an image, you can capture your star. Just find out what it's called in that star. Now I do warn you, some of those stars that people buy uh, can be quite faint, but SLU's telescopes will be able to capture it. You know, we can it turns out really, one. really faint, really faint stars. So you will be able to capture that. So I look forward to hearing your success on that. If you land up with any problems, then let me know, all right? Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you so much for joining SLU. Enjoy the views. You have got some wonderful other views. Star clusters. I'm showing a few here. Star, oh, look at that. Great star clusters. Nebulae. All manner of stunning, stunning celestial objects to, to enjoy. So I hope you enjoy your time at SLU. Anyway, thanks, man. Okay. Uh, so, uh, actually, look, we've got other members welcoming Maya um, to the SLU community. Um, oh, I'm just being told. Um, upcoming, oh, yes, upcoming animation question. You know, I was explaining um, how to um, scroll down on that bit. I'm not sure which bit I'm scrolling down on. Um, we have got, you know, making an animation, we have these quests, these activities that you can do with the telescopes. So we've got collection quests and stuff like that, but we've got the first of our um, discovery um, quests are going to come out in the next probably 10 days, uh, if, if I don't get any distractions. And it's going to be in the footsteps of Clyde Tombaugh. And it uses, this is going to be the quest, the, the first quest, Oh, so we've got some quests down here, look. Um, it's going to be the first quest 
that uses our new animation module. And that animation module allows you to totally within the SLU website, grab hold of some of those images that you've captured of say Pluto or this asteroid, overlay them, move them around a little bit, and then turn them into an animation. Uh, it's gonna be so cool. And you know, most, we've said this before, most astronomers or many astronomical discoveries are made through animating two or more images, whether or not it's discovering an asteroid or a comet um, or Pluto, a dwarf planet. You know, so loads of discoveries are made like that. And we've got, uh, we've got lots of really cool things to do there. Anyway, what are we looking at here? This is, oh, that was, oh, I missed that. Oh, Eta Carinae Nebula, look at this. Oh, I'm like a dog seeing a squirrel again, aren't I? I get distracted. This is one of my favorite. Actually, this object is one of our seasonal gems. Uh, so Southern Hemisphere at the moment uh, is going into autumn fall. Uh, Northern Hemisphere, we're in spring now. The seasonal collection quest is picking Northern Hemisphere and Southern Hemisphere celestial gems, the best objects there are in any given season. And this is one of the ones I have picked for the Southern Hemisphere fall. It's the Eta Carinae Nebula. Now, we have overrun, but it's a star party, so we're all relaxed around here. We have been talking about our asteroid, but let's just stay with this mission until it goes to colour. So the 17 inch telescope down in Chile, look, let's have a quick look at conditions because I think conditions are still pretty good. The moon is still up, but yes, we're standing that quite nicely. Thank you very much. Um, so Eta Carinae is down here where I'm pointing in the image. That's where the constellation of Carinae is, or Carina, sorry. Um, and what we're doing at the moment is that telescope is collecting photons. And first of all, it collects all the detail photons through what's called the luminance filter, because it's a grayscale, highly sensitive CCD camera. So we take lots of filtered images and we put them together. But what we're gonna learn up with it is we will wait, we will finish the show on a high, finish the star party on a high, we'll finish it and all snap an image of the Eta Carinae Nebula, one of my favorite Southern Hemisphere objects when it goes into color. So anyway, while we're looking at that, uh, loads of highs to everybody over there in chat. Um, hey, we did have a poll. I've forgotten to do so many things in this star party. We we're gonna have a poll. Do you prefer star parties versus traditional slew shows? We are gonna change up. We are experimenting with this. So it's been too much of me tonight, I'm sorry. We really wanted to get more of you coming in, but we're gonna do that a lot easier. Here is our poll. It's just popped up on screen. How cool is that? Well done, thank you very much. So I did remember, I did get it in in time. So which do you prefer, our new star party format or our shows? Now bear in mind that the star party is what we're gonna try and do is have you lot out there, SLU members, involved in it so that we're talking more rather than reading chat so much. But we're all going to be kind of clustered around the live telescope views around the world. And oh, there you go. It's gone into colour. Quick snap an image. Oh, <laughs> conditions look rather lovely tonight. Look at that. These huge clouds of dust and gas. So all of the objects that we see in this particular image are in our Milky Way galaxy. All of the, the points of light are stars. And then all of the color stuff we see is nebulosity, these huge clouds of dust and gas. Look at that red patch down at the bottom left-hand corner. Oh, wow. That, that is why this is my pick for a celestial gem, a sudden hemisphere fall. How cool is that? I think that has to be a really nice way of ending the show. But our new star parties, if you want to do them, we're going to get members to be able to form their own star parties, come online, invite other members in, and just look at the live images together, discuss stuff. It might be the Near Earth Asteroid team get together and want to do a star party, talk about their work, stuff like that. You know? uh, so 
anyway, that's what we're planning on doing. So give us plenty of feedback because really what the star parties are designed to do is focus these efforts on SLU members, not the rest of the world. Okay, I guess that's it. So, coming up, 34 to zero for star parties. Well, I think that's fairly conclusive. Well, thank you very much, everybody. That was our first star party poll. These are gonna be really cool, aren't they? Anyway, listen, um, uh, Maya, uh, we will talk about colors of the, uh, the normal ones uh, these normal color missions, um, maybe on a future uh, star party. So uh, do do that um, go over to the clubs. And if you want to suggest um, any star party topics or anything like that, then hop over there, look at this one. Oh, I'm going to get some, I'm going to get distracted again. So this is absolutely glorious. Franz, um, uh, Franz is a fairly new member, I think. Now he's set up a coordinate mission here. And what I can see here is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. About at least eight or nine galaxies. Can you spot them? Take a snap, have a look at the image at your leisure and see how many galaxies in this image you can spot. Maybe we should have a competition for that. But anyway, I think, unless anybody tells me otherwise over in HQ, we will wind up our second star party where we have been watching the near Earth asteroid, potentially hazardous asteroid Amor 52768 brackets 1998 OR2 closed brackets. Did anybody work out uh, the uh, order of discovery? I wonder from that description of how that was named. Uh, so, uh, May is saying galaxy between 10 and five on the right side of the image. Incredible, it is. Um, it is, you can see a dust lane going through it, can't you? The one on the right hand side, um, just where the S is, you can see a dust lane going through. Conditions tonight must be superb to see this kind of detail. So everybody stay glued to the Chile 2 telescope because I'm sure, let's have a quick look actually. Sorry, I digress. Um, we will finish, I promise you. Let's have a quick look though at the schedule. Uh, so Franz has got quite a few actually um, schedule coming up. Wow, quite a few. Uh, Tardigrade's got a couple there. Um, so, but we can just hop over. Let's go to mission setup because that's an easier way of seeing the schedule. So we we'll go to buy telescope. We'll go to uh, Chile 2. Let's see what's lined up. See if there are any open mission slots actually. Uh, let's take a look. Um, so they're all of Franz's uh, Astro Godsey. Oh, some new names there. Ghost of Jupiter. That's a lovely planetary nebula, that one. Uh, scrolling down. Loads of coordinate missions tonight. Uh, now, those are, that's uh, members of the uh, Near Earth Asteroid Tracking Team, the A Team. And when you see one of these, this is a candidate, um, either an asteroid or a comet. So if you follow that mission, you might actually find something um, unexpected in that mission. Uh, William Yeager. Oh, William Yeager. Um, William, congratulations. You were the second person to reach Hubble level uh, over the weekend. Uh, but at the end of the night, I think we've got some planets coming into view. Neptune is back, folks. Neptune is back. And uh, we've got Jupiter and Saturn looking rather glorious as well. We've got Comet 58P Jackson nu Nukemin. Now, this has been recently recovered, uh, this asteroid. And by the way, C20. Uh, 20 F8, I think that's the Atlas one. Um, that is a rather good looking comet. If you have not seen a comet before in Slew's telescopes, then you need to stick around till the end of the night. But anyway, that really does, I think, uh, wind it up uh, for tonight. Um, thank you very much, everybody, for joining our second star party. We will see you again very soon. Uh, keep an eye open uh, in alerts and the clubs and uh, we'll announce these as, as soon as we know when, uh, when we're gonna do one. But uh, do suggest uh, any topics that you'd like to cover. Hope you've enjoyed. Oh, and look at that. We are ending just where we need to. Somebody has shared an observation of um, 
Thathi, um, nice one. You have shared your particular observation of asteroid 1998 OR2. Well done. There it is. Bang, smack, center, or just to the left of center in your image. That's a fitting way to end the show. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Um, we'll see you again very soon, I hope. Bye for now. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, man. Bye, everybody. Nice job, Bye. Paul. That was awesome. Thank Bye. you, Thanks Paul. Us. And Tom, Bye. everybody. Yay. <laughs> I love star Bye. parties. Bye. <laughs> Bye, Kerry. <Bye. laughs> nice one. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye from Maryland. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, Jeff. Oh, and there you all are. I'm seeing you all for the first time. How cool is that? So I haven't been able to see you because I've been doing my screen share. Milton's there, Jackson uh, is there. Thank you very much for the um, question. David, Ross, a couple of you there. Um, somebody just called iPad. Hello, Mr. iPad. Welcome to the star party. Um, Cl uh, Clermont, Clermont um, is here. Uh, Mike Wagner, loads of people keeping, um, keeping hidden there. So uh, anyway, thank you, everybody. Sylvia's iPad is, is in the house as well. So bye for now. Hopefully the uh, Slew HQ will close us down any second. Bye then.